So, uh, I would now like to uh, introduce our speaker. Uh, our speaker is Mike Fitzwilliam, and Mike is here at the head table, and his wife, Carol, is here, and we have Margaret Scully, a genealogist from Mandeville, and we have Sheila Delacroix from Abita Springs. Abita Springs. So they are all our guests today. And now I'll tell you about Mike. Mike was born in New Orleans and spent most of his life there. He has also lived in Jacksonville, Florida, Atlanta, and Houston. He served in the U.S. Army Medical Command in Vietnam and 4th Infantry Division Administration and Finance Company at Fort Carlson, Colorado. Mike has a Bachelor of Science degree in secondary education from Loyola University with teaching fields in social studies and business administration. He attended the executive MBA program at the University of New Orleans. Mike and his wife, the former Carol Archer of New Orleans, celebrated 50 years of marriage in June. It was nothing. <laughs> they have lived in Pearl River County since 2002. His first book is entitled, Do You Know How Picayune Got Its Name? Mike is here to tell us about his second book. Mike held several accounting and management positions in his career and was employed for over 32 years with the Gulf Oil and Chevron before retiring in 2011. His last assignment was 13 years with Chevron's aircraft operations, including nine years at Picayune Airport. Mike is currently the treasurer of the Senior Center, the president of the Pearl River County Genealogy Club, and a member of the Ancient Order of Hibernians, uh, an Irish cultural and charitable organization. His topic today is his second book, Do You Know How These Places Got Their Names? Mike? Thank you, Jim. I have a, a couple of housekeeping things before I get started here. One of them is um, uh, through all of my genealogical research, uh, Carol's mother was adopted out of a foundling hospital in New York that was pretty notable for sending people down on an orphan train, and we believe that her mother was on an orphan train. And they, New York changed its laws a couple of years ago, and as long as you're within two generations of the person you're looking for, they'll actually give you some records. We didn't know who her birth parents were, but they did home visits after she came, and I found her on the 1910 census as a, an inmate in what they referred to as an asylum, and it had its own... Um, it had its own um, census <coughs> district. Mm -hmm. There were 2,800 kids at this place, and so the, getting them out into America was pretty too. And uh, on this day, 53 years ago, I had a date at the Proteus Parade with uh, someone that kind of stayed with me, so I wanted to give her an anniversary present here Aww. in front of witnesses. <laughs> Don't shake it, there's no money in it. <laughs> so I wrote this book a few years ago and I, I did a presentation here about how Picayune got its name. And uh, part of the reason I got into it is because my family owned a printing business that was right next door to the Picayune in New Orleans on Camp Street. And then I got to thinking, uh, I got curious about some other stuff and I said, I'm gonna research this. On helps, come on, there you go. And this one up here in the top was kind of the focus because, as you all know, there's not a lot of indigenous French names in Mississippi off the three coastal counties. That's kind of where the French came, it's where the Spanish were. When you get north of that, we're all the way to Memphis, it's kind of white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, former slaves and, and Indians. And I said, I wonder who these things are, because some of this is going to be specialized at Picayune. If you haven't been there, come visit, because you'll, you'll have a book that says, I, I know what's going on. So my background is teaching accounting and history, and it's two sides of the same coin, okay? 
They value evidence over stories. It's not that you can't tell people stories, but there has to be, even people that write fiction, it has to be believable. Um, Marguerite is, uh, she's like my uh, angel on the shoulder because I was writing my family history and I had a bunch of undocumented things in there just because I had read it. And she finally kind of whacked me over the head and said, how do you know that? Now, you weren't alive when that happened. I went, you know, you're right. And it changed everything. Because now I'm, I feel like I'm more than a storyteller. I'm a documentarian because this book that I just wrote has 476 endnotes in it. And I'll tell you up front, if you get a copy of this book, does the connections between the naming of these places and the, the, um, the personages are implied. I've found uh, hardly any documentation that said on this day, this place got named by these people for this guy because he was such a good guy and all that kind of stuff. So I have a lot of, a lot of sources that, that went into this. Um, I can put some stuff in this presentation that's not in the book, and I have some things in the book that's not in the presentation because I'd be here till dinner time if I did that. So I want to give you a, a, diff, a distinction here between stories and evidence. This is James Derby. There's a little town up the rail line called Derby. It's, it's kind of not there anymore, but the, it, you can still see a sign that says Derby, but there's not much there anymore. It's not a depot. So I started researching when I was doing this. I found a newspaper article that somebody wrote that had a kind of a background in doing local history. And I started reading and I said, well, this is going to confirm what I found out. Unfortunately, it didn't. So here's what I found out. Uh, the story was that he was born in England. And he wasn't. He was born in New York. Um, it said he wore a derby hat and a long frock tail coat. He had neither on and that. That's the only photograph that I've been able to find of him. He didn't have it on then, but that's, you know, it's just a point in time. Said he owned timberland and a sawmill, except that he didn't. He managed a hotel in Chattanooga. <laughs> <clears throat> and then he left to become the paymaster and the land agent on the New Orleans and Northeastern Railroad that was being built between Meridian and New Orleans in 1882 and 83. So he leaves there. The land agent was the guy in charge of finding rights away, getting people to sign over rights away so they could put up a depot and run the rail. So the article said he spent most of his time in New Orleans. I didn't find any evidence. Uh, the one thing that I did find that was true is that they named the depot named Derby because the sign's still there. Um, so he left in 1884 to go back to Chattanooga. They didn't need a paymaster anymore. The railroad's built. They didn't, need, they didn't need a land agent. All the land's been acquired. The depots are going up. Sawmills are doing. Uh, then he leaves Chattanooga in 1888 to go run a hotel at the foot of Pikes Peak. And I thought, why would you ever leave there? Because I, I was up there in the Army, as he told you. And it said, uh, the, this story said he cut all his timber and returned to England, which, of course, you already know he wasn't there. <laughs> so then he leaves Cascade, and he comes to sell real estate in Poplarville. And I went, this is like, he, uh, he probably had altitude sickness, right? <laughs> then he gets elected mayor of Poplarville. And it said, this guy says he died in England. And he died in Birmingham, Alabama. <laughs> so the lesson that I learned here is you can't accept the first thing that you find just because it agrees with what somebody told you in a restaurant. And Derby is a perfect example of that. So you're interested in why did I write this book? I told you I already was interested in this. I'll call it Sea town for now until I get to the, where I'm going with this. Um, people here pronounce this in different ways. Um, when we first moved to Picayune, after about a year or so, Carol had a job as a retirement development coordinator, and she, she has cousins named Carrier. So she said Carrier, and a girl that was, she was working with said, Miss Carol, it's Carrier. And I went, she brought, I came home from work, and I went, they got a symbol for it? <laughs> so it's not just a proper name. It actually has an American translation. So the best way I could describe this, is I put a little paragraph in the book that says, when you say that word, it immediately tells the listener which side of the Pearl River you hail from. <laughs> that seems to kind of bring people together, because I'm not saying no, right or wrong. But it means the same thing in English and in French. It's the same thing. Anybody care to guess what it means? So nobody's wrong. And I was telling, I was selling books at the street fair, and somebody, I was telling somebody this anecdote, and it dawned on me, it matters where you say it. So if you come here and you say, Carrier, they know you ain't from around here. And if you go to New Orleans and say, I'm looking for a career, they're going to take you to the employment office. <laughs> 
So it led to my interest in all these other things, and I thought, um, who is it named for? Because like I said, I didn't see a lot of uh, French people down here. This is the guy. And I found this is, this is a really interesting story, and it really got me started. He's on the board of directors at a railroad before it was even built. Before, as they were forming up, he's on the board of directors. He's the son of a financier named Antoine Carrier, who's from Bordeaux, France. My mother's family, my, my grandfather's family, is from Bordeaux, France. My daughter-in-law is from Bordeaux, France. So I thought, I'm getting closer and closer to Carrier here. So um, he owned a citizen's bank, uh, and it was an office next, uh, right down the street from a lumber company. And uh, I'm gonna, you'll see some names early in the beginning, and I'll tell you who they are later on. And I came to find out on the Bureau of Land Management website and, and his father's will, which was published in the newspaper, that he had 3,000 acres of land in Pearl River County, what, what, what was Hancock County at the time. It was in the will in the newspaper. There's a whole different story about his daddy, and I'll tell you later on. So the original name of that depot was Highland, and if you all know anything about that area up there, it's Highland Community Hospital, and it's pretty close to where this, the rail stop was. They changed the name to this in about 1890. But it had another name at the same time for the post office. It was called Lacey for the lumberman. He owned 50,000 acres of, of pine, yellow pine land around there. So these guys were connected. So I found this newspaper. Why I had this printed newspaper article, I have no idea. It was from 2005. A guy from the Picayune Item inter uh, interviewed a man named John Formby. Uh, the Formbys are real big up there. Mark was a state representative at one time. Um, and this guy was 90, John Formby was 97 years old. So his age just about covered the entire incorporated period of Picayune as a city. And he said he was on jury duty down in New Orleans. And the judge, he said um, he was from Picayune. And the judge says, do you know where Carrier is? And he says, yeah. He said, it's named for my grandfather. This is like a first person source. This is, this is really unique. So I said, so uh, it comes down to these two pronunciations and, you know, nobody's, I, I don't try to correct anybody. It's just what it is, you know. Um, so if you're a native to Mississippi and someone calls a carrier, how do you respond? Oh, well, you go, come on. <laughs> right? So there was a whole bunch of people that influenced the names on the, of the towns and the rail lines and the lumber mills. William Hardy was the guy whose idea it was to build a railroad. Eliza Jane owned the Daily Picayune, and she's got the, you know, the, they lived on the, the Fort Nicholson out here on the Beach Road. Julius Simmons came from Alabama. He was a turpentine farmer. Um, railroad executives, lumber executives, merchants, settlers. Um, so here's the guy that started the railroad. He was a Confederate Army captain, became a lawyer, and uh, he married uh, this woman, Hattie Lott. They were both from Alabama. They conceived it to connect to two other lines that had already been built. One was from Cincinnati to Chattanooga, then they had another one from Chattanooga to, Bur to uh, Meridian, and this one was going to be from Meridian to New Orleans. And it was supposed to bring all of the stuff, like the Alabama fields, would, uh, they would be bringing stuff down to New Orleans, and then there was lines being built from New Orleans out to the Pacific. There was another one he built that went from, uh, from uh, um, Meridian across Vicksburg and across out that way. They used convict labor sometimes, and, and they weren't afraid to put that kind of thing in the newspaper. Like, they were swapping between different lines. They said, oh, well, I need 130 of guys today, and they would, they would send them off. He created the Gulf and Ship Island Railroad between Hattiesburg and Gulfport. Actually, it goes to Columbia, and it connects with another line. And he kind of put a little town on the New Orleans and Northeastern that was going to be a big lumber mill place out of business. He named Gulfport. He wanted, he wanted this lumber to go straight to a deep water port without having to go all the way to New Orleans and all the way down the river. He created, he created and named Gulfport. And they booted him out for some reason. I never did find a reason, but they, they, I did find that where he, they booted him out. And Hattiesburg is named for his wife, but she died before ever seeing it. So these were the lines. You can see them right here. Here's the, the, here's the N-O and N-E going up to Meridian. Here's the other line that's going out through Vicksburg and Shreveport. And they were building another one right here. And I know that because one of my ancestors was involved in getting subscriptions for that line. <clears throat> so he conceived the line. They couldn't get it done. And he finally did. And he did it out of some self-interest. He had a patent for making gas out of pine rosin. 
So the financing came from a, 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 a German um, kind of financier, I guess. Him, him and his daddy were really rich. Um, this is an interesting story, uh, but I'll tell you in a minute, and uh, you'll, you'll be fascinated. They started surveying. They built it between January and November of 1883. This month is the 140th anniversary of Picayune having a name for anything. It, was just, it never was going to be on the original line. It was just, it, they got a flag stop, and even in a few years after that, they still weren't stopping there unless somebody put a flag out on the pole. And they were both of them from Alabama. So these are the Erlangers, and if you notice, there's a significant name right here. Um, she was John Slidell's daughter. So let me tell you about them. Baron Friedrich and his father were wealthy financiers in Paris. Um, Marguerite was the daughter of John Slidell. He was the Confederate minister to France. <clears throat> she married Friedrich in 1864, and I found multiple articles where they credit her with telling him, you need to use your money to rebuild the railroads in the South. Um, there's a lot of stuff named for them, and I've, I've been, I keep finding more and more. There's a town in Kentucky named for him, the hospital system in Chattanooga, and there's streets in Slidell, Poplarville, and Metairie, all named Erlanger. And he financed a whole lot of railroads. He almost rebuilt the railroads that uh, Sherman ripped up during the war. So here's John Slidell. Let me show you what the connection here is. He also isn't from around here. And I will tell you that there is a page in, in my book, I put an appendix in there because I started noticing a trend and it was that um, all the people, they, some, a lot of them died in New Orleans because there wasn't really a hospital system or in and around Picayune. They would go down to New Orleans and they were dying in Touro Hospital and a lot of other places down there. Um, nobody's from the area, nobody. Um, and the people who have written about it, including me, the mayor of Picayune, uh, Grandpa Thigpen, there's all kinds of it. Nobody's from Picayune. It's like this convention center where people show up and all of a sudden things happen. Carpetbaggers. <laughs> yeah, well, some of them, yeah, they were. You know. so, uh, he was a senator from Louisiana. He's a Confederate minister to France. And he went to France with a guy named Mason and, and, and Slidell's family. They're on a ship <clears throat> and they were impressed by a British ship. And they were put in a, in, a, in a federal prison in Massachusetts. This was late 1861. They let him out. They continued the trip. But he spent, like, the war years there trying to get them. Erlanger was okay with it. And what he was going to trade was future cotton for cash now to back the Confederacy. And Napoleon III said, your currency's worthless and you're losing all these battles. No. He, wouldn't, he would never meet with him. But he never came back to the U.S. He dies over there. He's buried over there. And 12 years before the railroad ever even got finished. So there was a railroad camp when they were building this. They started building it from Meridian on down. And as soon as they got to one, the first depot, it was an enterprise. I forget what the name of it was. But they, they would start regular service. Then the next depot, they'd get the rail down there. They would start going back to both of them. And they kept doing this. But they had to start on that railroad trestle by the twin spans going out of slide L at the same time so it was ready when they did it. And that railroad camp, um, the, the engineer who built that trestle is a street in Picayune that called Hawk Street, and he, he's the one that did it. He has an interesting history too. And I think the naming was for the family. There's, I found that somebody that wrote a letter to the editor to the St. Tammany farmer early in 1882 and they said specifically, and it was an anonymous thing, um, that Slidell was named for John. Um, I'm thinking that Erlanger, if he's sleeping with a Slidell, he's coming home one day and going, honey, guess what I did for you today? <laughs> so it's a family name. You know, there's no denying that. So was, uh, the, as I mentioned before, there was a, a turpentine farmer that came to uh, Picayune. This one's a little... Um, Kind of, you can't see it, but these are street names in Picayune. And here's, this is Highway 11 going through here. It was originally called Harvey Avenue. Um, Simmons comes in here, and he owns this land, and he donates it. And he says it had to be, it's for a city, and this is in 1901. They didn't get incorporated till 1904. But this is in 1901. He says, here's all this land, and they're going to lay out a grid of streets. Here's all, it was really, and it's a, there's a copy of this in the Picayune Library. And so they got all these streets named. This is, if you've been there, this is East Canal Street. It was originally called First Street because all the ones going north after that are 2nd, 3rd, 4th, up to 8th. I've, I've interviewed all kinds of people up there. Families have been there forever, and they had no idea. They, did, did, they, why did we, they never even questioned why it started with 2nd. 
So he was Picayune's first postmaster in 1891, and that's about seven or eight years after they put the flag stop up there. So you can see there's a little bit of development going on. So he donated all of this land. He lived in Picayune for a while. He was, you know, like I said, he's from Alabama. He lived in Picayune, then he moved to New Orleans, and he has both. Um, he had the unfortunate circumstance of getting struck by a car and killed. I found a newspaper article about six months before this announcement, and it said that somebody named J.W. Simmons um, ran over somebody else. So he's got a history. So I already gave you the answer to that. It's First Street. So. Um, so here's Cyril Harvey. At the time they laid out that grid, he was running the, the entire railroad. <clears throat> so that, that first street where Highway 11 is, it wasn't always Highway 11. It didn't go through there. <clears throat> it was Harvey Avenue. He's from Newfoundland. He's another carpetbagger. He came pretty far, though. So he's president of the Cincinnati, New Orleans, and Texas Pacific Railroad when the street got named. And the, those first five streets in there are all named for railroad people, none of whom ever lived in Picayune. They all, they all lived in New Orleans. The thing is, you can go in city directories, and you can see where they lived, and you can go on Google Earth and actually go see the houses are still there, and they were not poor people. So he resigned, and he got res the, the next street off of, of, uh, of uh, well, Harvey Avenue is Curran. He, go he does go to England and die, so the, the stories are getting kind of mixed up there. And Daniel Curran was the executor of his estate. There's still a vestige of Highway 11. It's on the, nor it's on the north side, but Highway 11 is just is, it's what it is. The funny thing is, in the 1950 census, as they were going down there, sometimes they would mark that block as Highway 11, and sometimes they would mark it as Harvey Avenue, and I went, I don't, who got their mail, you know? So here's Curran. This is a substantial guy. He's born in Ireland. Yay! Um, he succeeds Harvey in the job, and uh, in the summer of 1898, he fired an employee who uh, returned to his desk and pulled out a pistol and went and shot him. And he shot him in the arm. The employee, I never found, I can't find anything about, they never found the guy. I know his name. I never found him on the census. Um, they never got the guy, but they thought that he was going to come back because they owed him a paycheck. He's not coming back. <laughs> so the, behind the post office in Picayune, there's two signs. They've got some really ornate signs. They're black and gold. They've got the, the symbol for the city of Picayune. And on one side of the street, it says Kern Street. And on the other side, it says Kern Avenue. Y'all didn't have a proofreader? Come on. Huh? So he died in Turo Hospital in 1938. And like a whole bunch of other people, these railroad executives, they were in the Boston Club, and some of them were in the Pickwick Club, and that's Rex and Comus. So you, you can come from out of town, and if you got money, they want you. They've never asked me. So, <laughs> so here's Hogg. He's, a, he's from New York. He's the resident engineer. I told you he was responsible for that trestle across the twin spans. Um, he gets killed by a car in the CBD. This is, this is my second uh, traffic fatality. And the story said that they, uh, he, was, he was run over by a chauffeur for a doctor, and the doctor was in the car. And they pulled him up on the sidewalk, and the article says, despite being administered opioids, he died. You know what? Is there a, do we have a doctor in here? I was wanting to kind of ask him about, what, is, that, is that a treatment for a car collision? So, so Thomas Steele was the vice president and traffic manager for the whole, the whole railroad. Um, the, when you go on the Simmons Platte, the intersection where First Street was in Steel, it's spelled without an E. But every other intersection on Steel Street is spelled with an E on the end, and they've never corrected it. I brought this to the attention of the city council recently. I showed them a whole. There's streets in Picayune that don't have not only signs, they don't have a pole. And they said, oh, well, your hurricane took it. I said, this is not Dorothy and Toto. They don't lift <laughs> poles out of the ground. So at one time, he ran the whole, the whole shebang. <clears throat> So there's Gray Street. He was the chief clerk for Daniel Curran, and it, it, the, it sounds like he was like just an administrative assistant. I think he was more like the chief of staff because he ends up with a pretty substantial job. He's the joint agent for all three lines under this system. And he worked in New Orleans and Meridian. He gets hit by a car in Meridian. <laughs> You'd think being on a railroad, you're a little safer than that, but... This is the original schedule for the, uh, the rail line between Meridian. And I highlighted some of these because they're, they're mistakes. Um, there's a place up here and it says Barrett's. 
I've looked forever for Barrett's. As it turns out, I found a post office application. The name of it was Barnett. So the reporter made a mistake. There was never a follow-up to say, oh, oops. Um, it was, it's Barnett. Um, this one here says Ladinier. Um, it's it, Ladner. Uh, and I found many variations on the spelling of that name. So um, the two other ones that are on there, Highland and Mitchell, I've already talked about Highland. Mitchell, I actually have now met a descendant of the Mitchell that this, the place was named after. It's not there anymore. If you're familiar with Picayune on Highway 11, where the Picayune item and a Texaco station is, kind of up the, the road there, that's the, there was a station there at one time. So this is from an 1895 map, and it shows a whole bunch of the places that you may be familiar with, but um, this is two other, these two places right here are two that had this, two names at the same time. And if you notice, they spelled Picayune with a K, and it stayed that way. It was even on the 1910 census, but it was inconsistent because somebody must have got to the government and said, wait a minute, we're named after that newspaper and it doesn't have a case. So they've, ever since then it's been fixed. But it was, uh, Rand McNally got it. So here's Nicholson down here. Here's Richard, there's Picayune. The, the, all the dots are going up the line there. So everybody knows where Nicholson is? Okay. So what, these are two guys named Nicholson, two guys named George Nicholson, I might add. This is Eliza Jane's second husband. He was the business manager for the, the daily paper, and he bought in 25% of it because it was going under, and he saved it. He had a lot of money. He had a vineyard up around Vicksburg somewhere, and they, apparently they got popped for making alcohol back in the 1800s. So this is George Nicholson. The, the railroad's the construction was divided into two parts. Meridian to Poplarville and Poplarville to New Orleans. He had Poplarville to New Orleans. And you might notice his middle name was a harbinger of things to come here. So um, the story is that Eliza Jane was on the first train up and she names Picky and she was pretty famous in her own right. If, if ever, she was a poet. She married the guy that owned the Daily Picayune. Um, the funny thing, the ironic thing is that even I'm doing this, is she married him in May of 1872. In January of 1872, he sold the newspaper to a syndicate of New Orleans businessmen, one of whom was my great-great-grandfather, who owned the business right next door to him. There was 225 or 240 of these people, and within a couple of years, they found out 225 people can't run anything, and they sold it back to him. And three years after that, he dies, and she inherits the newspaper. She was the first female publisher in the United States. I think she got a twofer when she named Nicholson. And uh, it's, it's really kind of interesting because his headquarters was in Poplarville. I threw that in because I did a presentation for the Poplarville people and I didn't want to feel they were left out. So, um, so I'll put a few more in here. I've got uh, uh, every place in, up the rail line that was there. This is an interesting story to me. The northern part was constructed by a guy, uh, Major Sam Winery. And he and Hardy were on the train one day and they're, they're going down there and he says, I'm going to name this site for you. And Winery said, hey, nothing but a laurel swamp. It's just a bunch of trees out there. And he said, all right, um, we'll call the place Laurel, and we'll find another place for you. <laughs> what do you think the ending of this is? <coughs> There's no Winery, Mississippi. <laughs> so Ladner Hills there. So this was, this was really curious. I actually drove up there, and it's a pretty far, if you go off I-59 to get to the railroad track, they start to diverge, and it's just this winding road, and I finally get there, and it looks like there might have been something there. Um, th it showed up on that schedule as Ladinier. Um, there were two brothers named Batson, Randolph and Lorenzo Batson, and they decided they were going to set up a shop along the railroad to serve the people that were building the southern portion of it. And they... Uh, there's a Ladner in Pearl River County, but it's over to the, to the east side. It's not anywhere near the railroad. But you can still see this intersection, and the, there's a Batson Cemetery up there. Um, Rosa Batson, their sister, married a guy named Henry McGeehee, and he owned a big lumber mill in Picayune that has a history. Then he sold it to somebody, and they sold it to Crosby and Rollins, and um, now none of us there. So McNeil's, we're just kind of going up the highway here to some of these stops. Both of these guys came from North Carolina. They came to do turpentine. I didn't know before I did this that turpentine came from pine trees. They tapped them like they did maple syrup. 
I thought it came from a hardware store, so this was a real <laughs> education for me. I found them on the census. Their families lived next to each other in North Carolina. Um, Graham was named postmaster for McNeil, and I think he was living there, but Daniel McNeil wasn't. And I have met, his granddaughter is still alive, and I met her. She lives in McNeil, and she's very proud of this. And um, um, he moved from Lacey. Remember I told you there was two names down there? The newspaper article said he moved from Lacey to McNeil. So Lacey must have been something substantial. I don't know where it was, but it, all they said was his post office. So he got to be the postmaster after a variety uh, career. They had a mercantile company up there. And when he died, his wife took over. You know, I talk about today, Nepo babies. Well, his, his wife took it over. And then when she retired, his son took it over. So up in, into the 1950s. So Maddie Jo McNeil Fox gave me some help. As I got her phone number and I told her what I was doing. She said, come up and see all my stuff. So she had a bunch of random records and stuff. So I copied everything that I had and I brought it up to her. She didn't know some of it. And one of the things that she didn't know was how Daniel died. They knew he died, but they didn't know how. She didn't know anything about it. Well, that, his record is on file in the Louisiana archives. And I found a link to it and I, I sent them the money and they sent it back. And I, I did it like the TV show. I said, all right, here's all this stuff. And at the end I go, and surprise, he had cancer. <laughs> And, she, and the, the birth date that was on the death certificate is different than the birth year that's on his tombstone, and it doesn't agree with the census. So I said, well, which one do you think is correct? Well, I'm sure the tombstone is correct. No, I don't do that. <laughs> you don't know. Um, this is one of the big movers and shakers in Picayune. Um, again, they're not from around there. Um, Ellen Goodyear, there's a Goodyear Boulevard. It runs right down. It's where the county building is, the library, the St. Charles Borromeo. It runs all the way to where the lumber mill was. And he was one of the owners. And I thought, it's got to be related to the rubber company. I actually went and did her family tree, and I found out she's a third cousin twice removed from the guy who invented the vulcanization of rubber. So there's a connection, but it's getting kind of far apart. This is an interesting story because they didn't come there. They kind of got, they were in the lumber business when they got there. But he was on the board of the trustees of the Christian Science Reading Room in Boston. Yay! I told you I was going to get Boston in here. Huh? <laughs> so he got removed in 1922, and um, the, the other trustees said uh, the, the founder of the Christian Science uh, religion was Mary Baker Eddy. Um, and uh, the bylaws said that if you, in order for you to get on the board of trustees, you had to have her approval and the other trustees. Well, she died, and he's, he's on there. He got on after she died. And so they took it, the other trustees sued him and a couple of other guys, and they finally went to the Massachusetts Supreme Court and they said, um, they wanted to know what his defense was, and he said, I don't accept that she's dead. And they said, well, she be dead, <laughs> and you're out of here. And they booted him and the two other guys out, and next thing you know, he's in Picayune in the lumber business. It probably wasn't funny at the time, but look at, looking back, um, so he partnered with Lucius Crosby in buying the Rosa Lumber Mill, and it's at the end of Goodyear where Beach Street meets. There's a giant property back there, and they still refer to it casually as Goodyear. It might actually be on maps. It's not an official entity. Um, the lumber business, they bought into that mill in like May of 1917, right after the United States declared war on Germany. And they needed a lot of lumber all of a sudden because they were building barracks around the South and this was the premier lumber. They didn't want the lumber from Texas. They wanted Mississippi lumber and they got it. These guys got rich right off the bat and it lasted after the war into the 20s. And then the price started going down. This guy pioneered the planting of tongue trees. Do y'all know what they are? I mean, uh, Camille wiped out basically the industry and it's all back in China. It's a waterproofing agent yeah. that they use in the marine business. So he got lucky a second time because his plants were blooming right at the time the Japanese blockaded the Yangtze River in China and they couldn't get the stuff here. So all of a sudden their fortunes went boom right at the end of the depression and they're, they're making money because they needed to supply our Navy with waterproofing agents. Um, you can't eat these things, by the way. If you but try to bite into a tongue nut, we'll be at your services. So, so I put this in for the folks in Poplarville. Um, some, so, there's a lot of people out there that say it's a poplar is a uh, aberration of the word popular. Well, it's not. 
there's actually a tree up there called a tulip poplar. And when I was growing up, we had three of these in my front yard. My grandmother had three of these in her front yard in Jefferson Parish. And they used to send me to school with these and hoping that it would have more beneficial effect than just bringing an apple. And <laughs> So, but they had a bunch of people, they had five people up in that area called Jim Smith, and they gave him nicknames to distinguish them. So he got to be Poplar Jim Smith. Another guy got to be Bowley Jim Smith after the creek. And um, so this is the Tulip Poplar. Um, there's a radio station in Picayune, it's WRJW. It's named after this guy right here. He was in the lumber business um, in Bay St. Louis, and he sold out to Walter Jex. And uh, the woman who used to run the uh, Perover County Historical Society is Juanita Jex, and I think her husband, this, this guy, Walter, was like a great uncle or something to him. Um, he owned a half interest in that lumber mill with a man named Eastman Tate. He was a banker and a big businessman in Picayune. And he bought it out, and then he sold it to Crosby and Rollins. He was a big civic leader. He was, he was a philanthropist. He donated um, the land where Picayune High School is. He donated the land for the original St. Charles Borromeo Parish. It's an antique store now, a consignment store. Um, and the radio station is named for him. Um, in 1949, when they signed on, Pick Mosley was the mayor of Picayune, and the Crosbys um, wanted him to sign some kind of school board warrant and put it, at, take it out of a certain account. And he said, it doesn't, it doesn't come out of that account. Well, I'm an accountant, so I agree with him. And um, they said, if you don't do this the way we want, we're going to take all of our businesses and move them to Louisiana. They, and a lot of citizens there were working for the Crosbys, and he got them all marshaled in front of City Hall, and they forced him to resign. So right after that, Pick Mosley opens up the radio station, and he said there was no way he was going to name it for Lucius Crosby. So not, it wasn't going to be WLOC, so he named it after this guy. And it's still there. So he had a son named Granville. And he had, his son was Robert Joshua Williams II. I was in a bank in Houston, I'm mean, at Houston, in, in uh, Picayune, and I was talking to somebody and I said, I think I found out who to raise. It's not even on their website. It might be now that I did this, but, and he, they said, um, yeah, it was named after Robert Joshua Williams. I knew him. And I went, how did you know him? You're younger than me, and you, he died in 1930. And he said, no, no, I knew him. Well, she knew the second, and uh, I haven't seen her since. I need to go. I think they got a twofer because they couldn't go wrong with WRJW. It made two people happy. The, son, the grandson was a mechanic in the sawmill when the radio station signed on. So I'm thinking, that's not who you name a radio station after. Um, he ended up becoming a lawyer, so it all worked out. So here's L.O. Crosby. He's also not from around here. He's, he was into everything. This guy was a businessman. He was into everything. They moved to Picayune when he bought the mill. But he moved there with a lot of money that belonged to somebody else, International <laughs> Harvester. And I found a newspaper article that said he had, came with $3.4 million, and I put it in an inflation calculator, and I think it came to about $116 million in today's money. An International Harvester wanted a secure supply. They're still big in building wagons then. They need wagon tongues. There's all kinds of things. Tractors had wood on them. So they got lucky, and I, and I put in there, I tell my golfing friends this phrase right here, never discount luck, especially if I make a good shot. Um, he's got a substantial biography. I reprinted his, his uh, obituary from the, from the Times-Picayune in the book, and it, it goes into a lot more detail than I would want to do here. Landover clearance. Uh, Mississippi had a perverse property tax law that said your land was worth more for property taxes if your trees were still standing and out came the saws. And the next thing you know, they had prairies of stumps and they had to shut down the mills because they didn't have any more trees. And they weren't, they weren't that big into uh, reforestation. They, they either dynamited or bulldozed all the stumps out of ground because they found that they could still get rosin out of the stumps. And that held them on till the tongue oil business. So he was, in the, he was the processor. He didn't have nearly as much land as Rollins did. Roland, by one account, had over 900,000 tongue trees. So he was heavily into it. And he died in Turo Infirmary in New Orleans in 1948. So I just threw a few other things in here. I already told you about the uh, traffic accidents. Um, Millard um, was a, a, a big vice president on the line. And he quit the railroad to go work at the cotton exchange in New Orleans. And he got caught shorting cotton futures at the time the price was going up and got wiped out and went home and committed suicide. 
Um, yeah, Curran got shot in his office. Interestingly, Crosby and Rollins and Goodyear don't intersect each other, even though that was the intersection that basically built the fortunes of Picayune back in the, before 1920. Um, so two of the streets are misspelled, and tongue is the Chinese word for heart, and that's what it looks like. If, so a few more, I just got, I threw a couple in there. The French spelling of Picayune is actually Picayune. It's from the Provence region in France. It's a 16th of a Spanish dollar. And in the very first issue of the Picayune, which that, it, that's what the newspaper was originally called, the Picayune, they had a little paragraph and it says, when we exchange our Picayune for yours, it's what you bought the Picayune newspaper with. Um, it wasn't gonna be, and it got named. I, I presented the city council a couple of weeks ago with the actual newspaper article where the first mention of Picayune being anything ever appeared in print. And I said they had to put it in a public place. Um, so the first passenger train going north came at just a few months ago in November, and the first mention was just a couple of weeks ago. So Nicholson, I think I already covered this, yeah. He was the business manager. He bought 25% of the newspaper when it wasn't doing very well, and that's her ability to write and his ability to manage the finances was like a perfect marriage. Um, they're both from England. Anybody know what Nicholson's name before it was Nicholson? Why do you think they might have changed it? Crescent City. I haven't found any documentation, but sometimes when you have fact A and fact C, you can come up with a plausible explanation for B. My guess is Eliza Jane said there's only going to be one Crescent City, and it's not you. And it became Nicholson. And I just got a few more. I've profiled 33 people in here. As I told you, nobody's from around there. And the only one native to Hancock County is Eliza Jane Potterman and her people from North Carolina, from France. Um, of the 29 stops on that original list, only five of them are still working, plus Picayune because it wasn't on the list. This Purvis, there's a, Purvis actually, I don't know who put the website up. There's a website for Purvis, and it says that um, Thomas Purvis, they needed a right of way through his land, and when the railroad put the depot up, it, the, uh, his name was spelled E-S, and they said it was, uh, they put it up as I-S, and that he legally changed his name to P-U-R-V-I-S. It's a lie. I don't know who put it on there. It, I've traced this guy's family back to South Carolina, like to the 1750s, and it's P-U-R-V-I-S all the way. I found two documents that have E-S on it, and one of them was a will, and one of them was a land thing, and both of those were written by somebody else. It's not in his handwriting. So I don't, I don't even know who to tell to fix this website because it's not... <laughs> So there's a, there's a Richardson Road in Picayune up by, around where Mitchell was. Um, it's named for this guy, William Patton Richardson. He ain't from around here either, but he was rich and his daddy was even richer. He, um, anybody, is, if you're researching about the cotton industry, this is a guy you need to know, Edmund Richardson, because he had more cotton for himself than all of the country of Egypt at the time. This guy was really rich. Um, his son, John, had a big dry goods store on Canal Street, but they were basically a competitor for D.H. Holmes. Um, William owned 640 acres of ran land, and you can see it on the Bureau, the, the General Land Office website. You can see it, and the railroad cuts right through it, right where the Texaco Station and the Picayune item are. So Mitchell was the depot, Richardson was the post office. He died in New Orleans. I was not able to find any pictures of him, but I found Edmund and, and John. And I just wanted to kind of show you, these were just, so this was the beginning. This is the lumber business, you know, that they, it was a lot better than oxen. And it's also the end, but it's not. I have some land yap for you. WYES created a documentary about the digging of the New Basin Canal in New Orleans out by West End. Um, it aired first in November. It's probably going to get a lot of airing in next month. Um, it's called They Swung Their Picks, and I'm in it. They, I was doing uh, research for a book, and when I found out that they were going to do this and I found out who was involved, I gave them all of my research, copies of all of my research, and they used a lot of it in there. And then they called me up and said, we'd like to interview you. And I went, what? <laughs> and uh, so they did. And then I, I appear in there. I think I'm the only person in there that doesn't have a Ph.D., so I'm kind of walking around like, yeah, I'm bad. <laughs> <laughs> the end.
Oh, they, oh, I heard, yeah, I heard it. Murphy's on the They say about 40,000 died, Irishmen. Yeah. And there is a monument in New Orleans. I'm in the organization that. They, they originally, I think, asked the, the slave owners to use the slaves. They right. They said, hell no, they're going to die. Well, I'm at, let me let me walk you back on that. Okay. Uh, the historian for the Hibernians, which is an organization I'm in. By the way, for those that y'all all know about the Hibernia Bank, it's been long gone. Hibernia is the Latin word for Ireland. Um, uh, my great great grandfather was one of the founders of the Hibernia Bank in 1870. The historian for the Hibernians, we have a, par a four acre park out there at West End right now. It's called the Hibernian Park. And um, when they first started, they got money from the state legislature, they got money from the government of Ireland, they get private donations, they're, they're doing really well. If there's a bunch of, there's about six monuments out there now. Um, he stood up and he said, before you go telling anybody on one of your monuments that thousands of people Irish died, I'm telling you it's a myth. And I went, I'm gonna show you. So what I did is I went back and I found that there was only, the, the, the Daily Picayune had not been open yet. It, it didn't uh, come into existence until almost a year before the canal was finished being dug. St. Patrick's cemeteries in New Orleans didn't come into existence until three years after the dig. So if all these people died, where were they going? Nobody's been able to run that. There's a guy named Richard Campanella that teaches at Tulane and he puts a lot of stuff in the Picayune. This guy's brilliant. I've had many conversations with him. And I sent a note to him when I was doing all my research and I said, here's a, here's a good source, this guy's into it. He's, and I said, if you were gonna write this book, how many people would you estimate died? He said, if you say that nobody knows you're on firm ground, <laughs> that's where I'm gonna leave it. Um, but that park is out there and I gave them, uh, what I did is I found out there were death notices in a New Orleans newspaper called the Commercial Bulletin. And they had discrete parts. If you look at some today, some of these things go on for like three columns. I mean, these people have had, these were like one line, maybe they had a, a, a name and an age and maybe where they're from. And I discovered that they had discrete parts to them that would fit in an Excel database. So I would put in there the day it appeared, the date as best I could determine that they said they died, and then last name, first name, whatever information, like if you have a column for age and a column for comments, like this guy was a doctor. Well, if you're a doctor, you're probably not digging at that canal. You're doing everything you can to stay away from that canal. And they're doing picks and shovels and wheelbarrows for six miles, and then they let the water in. One of the stories was that they took the bodies and they just put them to the side, and then when the water came in, it all washed over them. And they th I, I firmly believe that the archbishop of the time would have been horrified to know that that was going on. I have no idea how many people died, but I will tell you, cholera was out there, uh, yellow fever was out there, and these are two things you can't transmit between people. Cholera is a bacteria in water, and yellow fever comes from mosquitoes. So I could be standing right next to you, and I got bitten, and you didn't, you die, and I'm still going, what happened? So th there was a lot of things going on back then. The sanitation wasn't that terrific. There's no portal that's out there. You know, they can't go to the mall when they're done with their shift. It was just a grim environment, you know. And then they let it in, but it was a big boon to the city of New Orleans because people could come from the North Shore, the truck farms, and go right into downtown by Howard Avenue where the, the Archdiocese building is. But, it was, uh, but I gave them all my research, and they used some of it in that video. So if you just go on the... If you go just put in, they swung their picks in YouTube, you can see it, it's on YouTube now. And they, it's, a, it's a really interesting story. They did a good job of, Arthur Hardy's in it. There's a bunch of guys I'm in the Hibernians with that are in it. Terry Fitzmorris from Harry Tulane. Uh, Terry Landry. Harry Connick. Harry Connick, huh? He is? Yeah, he, Harry Connick's in there. He lived out in Lakeview by the canal. And they tell you stories about way back when. Uh, yeah, that's an interesting story. Because my daddy was at Loyola with Harry Connick. They were in the same fraternity. Yes, um, they paid them as by best I've ever understood a dollar a day. Where if you just got a teenage girl slave, it was probably five hundred dollars. And uh, I, the reason I think I didn't, I, I did, I have a thing of a database that's six months of all of the deaths in New Orleans for six months. There's hardly any Irish names in there. My speculation is that the, the Irish, if they could, they kept their money and they sent it back to their relatives in Ireland. It was called the American Letter. 
to get their family to come join them to improve their circumstances. They were probably working their buns off out there. Um, I was doing research on the renaming of Nicholson to Crescent City, <clears throat> and I was doing a search on Crescent City, and I can narrow down my searches for um, the state I'm looking for. And because the railroad initiated in Cincinnati, I put in Ohio, and it gave me a hit on Crescent City, and it was an interview with a guy named Simon Cameron, who was in Lincoln's cabinet, but in the 1830s, he was the one that was bringing the Irish people in from Pennsylvania to dig more, more carpetbaggers. <laughs> got an early start. He was bringing them in, and I found news articles that said, here's this ship that landed with X number of Irishmen for the canal. And uh, I don't, he, he, he said he got 1,200 people to do it. I haven't, it's very, well, nobody's writing about that back then. And our historian, for, for another example, said the newspapers did not want to put that kind of thing in there because it would scare people off, even though they were blaming people from out of town from, for bringing the cholera and the yellow fever in. It was terrible. I said, no, the mosquitoes were already here. People would escape to the coast or St. Tammany to get away from the mosquitoes. Good luck with that, huh? Right. Well, I went to St. Charles Borromeo High School in Bethlehem, Louisiana. Yeah. No, that, the Comets. The connection between the two? The name. The name. Yeah. 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 No. It was a Catholic school. Yeah, that, it, that, yep. that church was formed in 1917. And it was, like I said, it was, in, it was on the corner of uh, West Canal and uh, Rester, I think, and uh, Quince, one of the streets in, uh, in Picayune. And then they, they eventually got the, the new one built uh, before we got there, back in the 90s, huh? Yes? Well, I'm, I'm not a carpet bagger because we didn't have any carpet bags. But Mary Beth's family, and I married into her family, is from central Illinois. And we have some of the richest farmland in the world because the Irish came in and dug drainage ditches all around central Illinois and got rid of the swamp. So they not only dug them here, but they dug them um, if you see this video, you'll see a, um, a photograph in there of an oil painting of a Thomas Fitzwilliam. He's my ancestor's brother. He got to New Orleans about 30 years before the rest of the family. And, I'm, and he was building row houses. He owned the land that St. Patrick's Church is on, and he's who sold it to the congregation in 1835. And they have the original act of sale in the uh, archives down in the conveyance office down in New Orleans. And I went in there one day and I, I found this out and I said, can I get copies of this? They said, well, you can put it on a CD for you, but it's $2 an image. I said, I don't care if it's $50 an image. This is really important. It's got my name on here. <laughs> and his wife's name is on it. The archbishop signed it. And in the middle of it, it said, I couldn't figure out how a guy who grew up under the penal laws in Ireland in the 1790s, early 1800s, is in New Orleans building row houses just a few years after uh, Battle of New Orleans. And in the thing it said, out of earshot of her husband, his wife told me that they were selling the land to replenish her dowry. I, went, I knew it, he married money. I said, should have done that. Yes? You mentioned a fellow by the name of Harvey. Yes. Did he have anything to do with the Harvey girls, what they had to do with, I know, trains going out west? I doubt, well, I doubt it, because um, his focus from all of that I've read was just this railroad, and he just was moving up the line. You can see him at different jobs in the Cincinnati city directories, and he got to be the head of it, and when he retired, he just went to England, and that's where he passed away. His, his will is online, and it's really interesting, because I did all, all, everything I saw was C.C. C. Harvey, and I, I want to put what his name is in there, and I finally found it, because his will was online. C.C. Yeah. is the Rooney girl. Hmm? I think C.C. is the one with the Harvey girls and the out west on the trains. I think that's C.C., isn't it? He's C.C. He's there could C. be another one, but that, that, that's a story I don't know about. Yeah, well, they tell you all about it if you go out west. To the Colorado and um, Grand Canyon. Because that's the yeah, people they went who... Out they were. Yeah. Really? Mississippi legislature wipe out the timber business with that tax? Was that, I mean, if, if it, I understand you correctly? Within the first year of the railroad's existence, 52 sawmills popped up and people were cutting it down. They cut two things out of it, the turpentine and, and the lumber itself. They actually were using the lumber to build the boxcars on the railroad. It was like a self-sustaining thing, but then they just cut them all down. And I, I, the tax? That's the story that I read. 
there. There's probably more to it, but they were just, it was just entrepreneurs out there trying to make a buck before. Yeah. I'm going to cut it down before you cut it down. Yeah. countries, and you know, you can't look at history today through the lens of what it was back then. Right. They didn't realize conservation. They just, no. Like you said, we yeah. make it, my job is to cut the trees down. One of those bet. cut the trees down, I go somewhere else and cut the trees down. Exactly, and then they started moving into Washington and St. Tammany. Some of the same people yeah. uh, were going over there. The Poitavance, Eads Poitavance is over there. He's a big lumber guy over there. Three of the Poitavance have been wrecks, by the way, so there's a lifelong connection to, from money to parades. Um, the name Ladner, now my grandmother and my great-grandmother grew up here in Bay St. Louis, and my grandmother told me when I would talk about people named Ladner that I met, she would say, it used to be Ladnier. It was, right. and it was an apostrophe after the L, yeah. the, the original people so that got here. Stopped. There is, there's a Ladner family uh, lineage on the internet that is really extensive and it goes back to people in France. Um, the, the, I didn't know this when I got into this. I just, I get curious about stuff. And uh, the, the um, lighthouse operator here was Christian Ladner. So Past Christian is named for that guy. And I, I, once you get into this, it's like, you, you try to take the stuff at the top of the funnel and get to the bottom. This stuff seems to work in reverse. The more I learn, the more the wider the top gets. So if you'd like to ha get a copy, this is, a, this is it right here. Um, we can, we've got a box of them up here. The Picayune book is $12 and the, this one is $20. Um, I, I'm thinking about a, a potential for uh, making a revision, but I'm just kind of exhausted right now. We just spent a week at Mardi Gras and I can't even, <laughs> you're lucky I'm here. Dad, thank you. We have to go celebrate our anniversary of me looking down the block at the parade going, hello.